So I'm Alan Percy. I'm a child neurologist. I've been at the uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham in the uh, Department of Pediatrics uh, in the Division of Child Neurology. So Rett syndrome is a, a, an interesting disorder that uh, was first described uh, in the 1966, but unfortunately it was written in German and published in a Vienna Medical Weekly newsletter that was not widely read. Uh, it was uh, first seen by Andreas Red and colleagues in Vienna, and then uh, probably beginning in the late 50s, and also by Bengt Hogberg and colleagues in Sweden. Um, there were some differences in their reports uh, that uh, delayed publication of any further information until uh, 1983, when Hogberg reported in the Annals of Neurology, uh, about 35 uh, uh, women or girls with Rett syndrome, uh, not only from Sweden, but also from France and Portugal. It was recognized initially that uh, this was uh, a disorder which occurred only in females, and therefore, during the first initial diagnostic criteria, eliminated boys and excluded them. Um, we, uh, at, uh, I was at Baylor College of Medicine at the time, uh, we felt, along with others, that it must be an X-linked gene because it only occurred in, or seemed to only occur in, in females, and what else could it be other than a genetic cause? Uh, there, it would have to be a pretty smart virus to pick on girls, or if, for example, uh, so in 1999, Huda who was uh, working at Baylor at the time, and actually uh, when we first saw our uh, first uh, girls with Rett syndrome at Baylor, uh, she was uh, finishing her training in child neurology. But uh, her laboratory uh, recognized or identified mutations in the gene MECP2. Uh, since that time, uh, we more than 300 different uh, genetic variations have been identified, and uh, there is uh, certainly a difference in uh, effects of specific mutations, uh, and there perhaps are a number of reasons. Some of the uh, mutations uh, occurring earlier in the gene are more significant, but also the there's a phenomenon known as X chromosome inactivation, during which one of the X chromosomes is silenced in a female. And uh, so therefore, changes in X chromosome inactivation, uh, even with two girls with the same specific mutation, could lead to differences in their clinical appearance. But there are also other factors. That's it, which include the genetic background of that individual, other genes, for example. It includes the environmental uh, exposure that uh, these girls have. Uh, so a girl uh, who has given very much attention, uh, very much therapy, is likely to do better than a girl who's just left in the, to sit in a wheelchair or her chair uh, throughout the day without much uh, stimulation. And there's a further, further factor that uh, really has not drawn much attention. But if you think about Rett syndrome, this gene, MECP2, involving mainly uh, brain cells, neuron neurons, and astrocytes, um, the distribution of the mutation in the brain is not predicted, it's random. So two individuals could have completely different representation of the abnormal gene in, in the brain and therefore could have different effects. And we have seen of this in uh, girls, uh, twins who are identical twins, both had the same mutation. And one girl uh, did well and actually went to college and the other girl has classic Rett syndrome. So there has to be uh, other factors which uh, explain the difference in 
the impact of these specific mutations. We've recognized uh, over the years that survival can go uh, beyond 50 years of age in uh, half of the individuals with Rett syndrome. Um, and that is uh, really striking when you look at the uh, first girl group of girls that were described by Andreas Rett. When uh, the, they were looked at, there was only one girl who had a woman that they had identified uh, beyond the age of 25. So the, the, there's been a definite change in our approaches to Rett syndrome. Uh, we really do not see some of the impacts uh, on the physical uh, deformations that these girls have uh, or had back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s because of the more aggressive treatment of the, these changes, as well as better um, control or interest in their nutritional status, their other medical issues. Uh, this is a complex disorder, which requires uh, uh, a really a team of uh, physicians and allied health individuals, and not simply a neurologist like me or a geneticist uh, to manage. Now, there's an interesting uh, aspect to this that um, initially, uh, there were descriptions of boys who had uh, features suggestive of Rett syndrome. And uh, ultimately, with the definition of the mutations or variations in MECP2, uh, we identified a, a fairly significant number of boys with mutations in uh, MECP2. Still, the number is much less than uh, in females. So we are aware now of roughly 100 boys who have mutations uh, throughout the world. Interestingly enough, the, the clinical features of boys with mutations is much more variable than in girls. So there's a substantial number of boys who have a very significant uh, breathing difficulty and, and movement disorder already in the newborn period and they may not survive uh, long uh, because of significant breathing issues. Um, there are other boys on the other end of the spectrum who have typical Rett syndrome. And this is because of a curious, again, genetic feature where um, shortly after birth, there's a process known as somatic mosaicism. So these boys, uh, develop two populations of X chromosomes and therefore may look very much like females. Uh, there's a genetic disorder, uh, which we also have a boy with typical Rett syndrome who has this additional genetic disorder, which is Klinefelter syndrome or 47XXY. So uh, in a sense, he, he uh, in terms of his X chromosomes, uh, could be similar to a girl. Uh -huh.